Good evening, New Bedford, New Bedford Guide uh, followers, South Coast residents. Chris Rosendi is here with the Chris Rosendi Show. Uh, I'm okay. Got a couple dog bites through the suit yesterday, and it was uh, a fun experience. Uh, I was just chatting here with the sheriff prior to the show. A um, lot going on in that department. We also have City Councilor Ian Abreu on tonight, who uh, is really working on some cool uh, ordinances and really trying to make people accountable for their properties and for their actions here in the city. We're gonna discuss some of that stuff. We're gonna to touch upon some medical marijuana uh, and recreational marijuana with Ian. Uh, now that the, uh, now that it's legal, uh, it's now recreational at some points. And we're gonna see what's happening uh, with getting some uh, shops here in New Bedford getting going, uh, raise a little uh, revenue from them. Uh, no further ado, my guest tonight, Sheriff Tom Hodgson and uh, City Council Ian Abreu. Uh, thank you both gentlemen for being here tonight. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having no, me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thanksgiving, guys? It was, it was great. It was great. How about yourself, Ian? Uh, anytime I can spend some time with my two-year-old daughter and uh, my wife and my family, it's a good day. So it was, uh, you know, you both you guys uh, have children, you know, older than mine, but I'm sure you remember what it was like when they were two and three years old. Special times. Yeah. So. I got a three-year-old. She acts a little like bit old. She, well, she actually, she's I was going right to say. Now, she's, she, uh, Wait till she gets good. to be 13. Well, easy. <laughs> Speaking of which, Sheriff, I, uh, I, I was on Facebook. I saw her. Uh, I'm friends with your daughter on Facebook, and there were uh, quite a few pictures. You did a lot of family stuff yourself with the grandson and all that, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hey, Thanksgiving. Uh, it was a great time for, I think, all of us to start to reflect, particularly with the divisiveness going on in the country and all that, to take a look at what are the real important things in life. You know, and um, certainly that that's family, and uh, it starts there. Family's the core of our society, Excellent. and um, so you know that's the microcosm, and and so that's a good place to start. You know, to absolutely. It's funny you say that, Sheriff, because I was thinking the same thing earlier. It seems like people in my circle, anyway. <laughs> People are enjoying Christmas more this year, I think. I think, to your point, people are realizing that family is really the epicenter of our communities and of our nation, and I think that's very important. So, to your point, I, I, I think you're spot on with that assessment. For I think sure. with the reestablishment of being able to say Merry Christmas again. Uh, yeah. You know, where, it's fun. Where where it's, you know, yeah, you know, my doctor told me, uh, not my doctor, my child, <laughs> uh, my son had a yeah, checkup this afternoon. Said the whole happy holidays and uh, this past week at church. When somebody says that to you, make sure you just say Merry Christmas. Yeah, I do. You know, I do. I, I mean, we have to be careful not to sing Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer now and yeah. a few of these other Maybe things. Maybe it's cold outside. Outside. Maybe it's cold outside. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can't say that I'll anymore. Tell you, um, you can't say bring home the bacon anymore either. That's what I heard yeah. today. Yeah. 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 yeah Peter, well, Peter's upset. You can't be talking about animals that way. Yeah, and and you know what's interesting? Uh, I I think. This is probably, you know, there's an old saying, in order to get out, you have to go through. Yeah. And so, unfortunately, you know, we're at a time where we're actually going through. And I think this is a time where um, we have to, as Americans, decide what are the important things for us and insist that those things not be marginalized or, or broken down. Um, <clears throat> you can be sensitive to things, but when, when we start looking at people changing these long-standing traditions that somehow we survived through. Uh, I mean, if you can show me where, you know, bring home the bacon and give me some, some real hard facts around where that actually hurt somebody. Um, you know, um, Rudolph the Reindeer, rain, Rudolph right. the Red Nose Reindeer, I could probably say that once or twice. Um, just that. You know, when you think about it, how many how many kids were harmed by that? I mean, I don't want to be harmed by that. I mean, these. these what are they trying to say is wrong with Rudolph? Do you know what I'm about? We used to sing it in school. Yeah. yeah. When I went to the Gomes School as a child, we used to sing Rudolph, and you know, and uh, you know, you know, love, easy. You know. We don't want to hear the. No, 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 we don't want to showcase the no, no, singing. No, no. You'll go down in history like Judge Washington. We used to say that and do all the funny things as a kid. We, yeah. I don't know. And I the, enjoyed singing it. And it's it's cold outside. I mean, come on. What's where? Who's been harmed by that? And you know who, uh, at the end of the day, these people that I noticed, uh, it's people that have no skin in the game for whatever it is. The, 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 the people who make the most noise, and like I see a lot of it, especially with uh, the rights of African Americans. It's like the white lady that lives in, in Waltham or, you know, the suburbs, Brookline, sure. and that, you know, lives in a community where that's like point. 2% African American. Why did you leave, live there if you feel so strongly about them? Why don't you live in an urban area where you could actually be part of that community if you want to, 
you know, and, and you see this, and you're like, come on, man, you know, it was, you see it on the it's phony for, the, for a lot of it, you know? Yeah, you know, I think, I think, I, I haven't quite sort of figured out in my own head why there was this need for people to feel that they have to project that they're somehow empathetic. Of, exactly. Of you know, and it may be partly the breakup of the family, and that, that, that we don't spend. I mean, the very few dining room tables sold anymore. Where we that's where we learned those those it's great true. values yeah, yeah. and things. So, yeah. so now, if you look even at the immigration issue, how do these people in America say, "Hey, um, look, um, these poor people, these people are all running from places in other parts, and and it's it's so bad. We should allow them to violate the laws." How do you how do you look past Chicago to the border. Forget about those kids who have nowhere to go, who are living in these neighborhoods that are wrought with violence, murders on a regular basis, gun violence through the roof, and literally. And um, <clears throat> and how do you how do you as an American look past that and say, well, they don't matter? Where do those kids run? Mexico? I mean, you can't. If I believe what's happening is, it's too close to home. Where I'd have to deal with it and really do something, so I can still sort of feel that sense of empathy if it's far enough away and I don't have to do anything with it. And I think, sadly, that's what's been going on. Yeah, I mean, both you guys know I'm really, really a proponent of doing good things locally. You know, we I've are. been out there the yep. past three weeks. I think I've promoted ten toy drives and gone around and just you know used up my own time to help. Local stuff where I can actually make a difference. You know, right. I'm not in the position where you are, where you you're pretty much a national figure now, where you can do stuff in terms of a large scale and federally and all that. Where me and you know, and I'm less than what Ian can is possible is capable of doing in his position. Where I can just if I do little stuff every day locally and in my own backyard to your point, I can really make a difference. But you know what Instead I Instead of being on social media screaming about stuff what, I have no what, control what, of. What I think, what, what, what Chris just said to me, um, you know, he, he, you mentioned that, you know, I'm more involved in national things, I'm involved in local things, of course, but, but I do on certain issues speak out nationally. But the real important ones, the people who are moving the country, are you. And the people at the local levels who are, who are, who are really drilling down and making the difference every day. Um, Washington. Come on, what are they doing? Yeah, they're just, I mean, they're just I mean, how much more broken? If they were a business, and we sat here and we were, we, we would right. never go buy something from them, right? Because <laughs> they can't they, they can't do anything. But my point is, when when people like yourself are doing those things, that's the seed that that starts a national initiative. That's the thing, and and that's why it's so important for Washington to be connected at the grassroots level with yep. the people who are serving a local government, the people who are going out like yourself and doing things that are really making a difference in the community. That's, that's how the country gets motivated. It yeah. isn't going to be done sort of in a national perspective where you sort of just, hey, let's try this. You want to see it grow from within, neighborhood by neighborhood, kid by kid, family by family, like you're doing. Yeah. That's that's what moves America. I just do it here on New Bedford, guy. A guy like Ian, who like honestly, I've spoken to him off camera. This guy is on Facebook, and it, I don't know. I don't know if you're if you're like Coach Belichick, we say that face space, and I don't know how savvy you are in the world. Not, not real uh, savvy, but so you know. I just found my on button the other day. Yeah, the guys, uh, the guys on social media, Ian. Yeah, and uh, you know, the garbage man didn't pick up my trash, and they. Tag Ian Abreu in the neighborhood groups on I, Facebook. I, I dealt with one he, today on Hawthorne Street. And you know what? He yeah. he gets on and he and he takes care. Of it. You're talking about like a guy who yeah, actually so you get direct access to yeah. exactly. Well, you know, it's interesting to the point that was made earlier. Um, uh, things like potholes or a diseased tree in front of someone's home, and the sheriff was a counselor like like I am, so he probably I, not probably I know he dealt with those issues uh, as well. The pothole, the street sweeping, that diseased tree, the cracked sidewalk, that street light that's out, that stop sign that was blown down or knocked over, 
on the whole surface, that might not seem like a huge deal, but to that resident, that constituent, that taxpayer, that is the most important thing to them right now at this point in their life. And it's incumbent upon us on the local level to take care of those things. They call taxpayer services or constituent services, whatever you want to call them. Uh, you know, their tax bill, public safety, uh, economic development, how are we growing our tax base here in New Bedford? all the local stuff that's important. Uh, the national stuff is great. You talked about it. The national stuff is very interesting. We follow it. But driving home the local stuff, the local initiatives, and not just the locally elected officials, but people like Chris and other people throughout the local media and other community advocates, everybody should step up and do their part, one way or the other. Uh, if you don't like the way things are going in your neighborhood, start a neighborhood watch group. Right. Why not? Start one. Um, if you have a concern about, I don't know, public safety or taxes, we'll call your counselor, show up to some of the meetings, be engaged. All of our meetings are open to the public. Come on in. They're the people's house. You know, Brian Gomes, you know, the people's house. That's his slogan, but he's right. It's the people's house. Come on in. See what we're doing. Be part of the process. I personally, I want to empower each and every New Bedford resident. That's important to me as a local elected official. Well, yeah, I want you to know where your tax dollars are yeah. going and how we can help. You definitely, you definitely are accessible, especially on social media. Uh, in terms of accessibility, I mean, I haven't asked you to come on the show without you ever saying, no, yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it. And you do it with several other venues as well. Uh, the accessibility and, and just the wherewithal to know that you have to be out there and just stand by no matter what, I know that you do. You know that every time you open up your mouth, there's going to be the people yeah. that... And you just okay. continue to just, you know, be steady and, and, and on, on that same path that you've been on for quite some time now. But we can't, you know, we can't do it without, without your venue and what you do. Because the public can't be educated about everything that he was just speaking about. You know, people want to know how to do this, how to do that, how do you access th certain things. How do you, you know, how do they understand how to go about it? But for people that may be watching the show today, they may not... They may not know that you were on there, and now they sure. know how to go about doing it because you're providing the venue to get that out there, which is huge. So it's really, um, I think we all have have a role, obviously, at the local level, yeah, to of um, to deal with those things in a way that people can get access. It's you know, it's in this day and age with all the with all the means that you can just reach thousands of people with this device yeah. that everybody carries there's really no reason for no accessibility i mean this guy's locally some local delegation state delegation that we've asked to come on and they just could kill us it seems you know and it's disconcerting that's too bad it's that's disconcerting too bad. because it could help out a lot of things and now you know i've already formulated opinion based just off of that and you know what i i'm never afraid to be asked the hard question because that's and i'm here to answer the hard questions I don't, I'll never shy away from an interview. I think you know that, Chris, and yeah. the other local he, he, uh, media he already outlets. tried. He said, hey, in a couple of weeks, I got something coming on I want to talk about. It's, said, it's, yeah, something's right, coming up, all right? <laughs> so, but you know what, though? Like he just said, as I get a FaceTime request from somebody, you know, while I'm on the air, what's wrong with these people? You, you were told to put it on silent. I you was on silent, on. but uh, <laughs> come on. I'm on the air with the Chris Resendi <laughs> show. But uh, no, in all seriousness, um, you know, coming on these programs, it's an important outlet for me and for all elected officials to talk about our agendas and what we're doing. Or, you know, some, maybe what they're not doing. Maybe that's why they don't want to come on your show. But I'm always ready, willing, and able. I know many of my colleagues on the council would want to come on here as well. You've had Joe Lopes on here. I think I've had pretty much. Uh, you've had, uh, yeah, you've had most of my colleagues yeah. on. The council is great. All 11 of us, we're, we're all transparent. Yeah. We all want to come on and talk about what we're doing because we love what we do. Do you ever miss the days of the city council? Um, I enjoyed my time there. Totally out of left field. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, no, I think I, that's the first I, time I've actually... I, I enjoyed my time there. It was a great... Um, that was my first serve, uh, time serving in elective yeah. office. And I really... Um, I learned a lot. Uh, and I enjoyed my time and my colleagues. Uh, but I, I think I was not meant to be a legislative type. Yeah. Um, but it's, it has to be somebody that really enjoys it um, to stick in with it for a long time. I, I, I prefer more how the executive role. You, how many terms did you serve? I served um, almost three full terms. 
okay. before I got a point. I stepped down in the last, uh, I think the last six months or so of my okay. my third term because I was appointed at that point. I assume you were the chair of public safety? I was not. Oh, really? Chair. Okay. No. Figured that would have been in your wheelhouse. Well, it would be, but yeah. I wasn't the chair. Okay. Uh, we had more senior people there. Okay. That, um, and I was, I know it's going to surprise you, I was a little outspoken. But, um, <laughs> but um, no, I did enjoy it. I, th I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about the process. And I thought it was, um, it was great for me um, in my first chance to, to, to serve the public. So, so that was your first uh, political position? First time, yeah. Yourself as well, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, did you serve in anything else? No, no, it was my first time serving, yeah. I had ran twice prior, and then I had gotten elected in 2015 when David Alves decided not to run. There was an open seat, and I was subsequently reelected in 2017. So I I, I'm, I'm winding down. Well, next year will be the end of my second term already, which is crazy. He knows these, these legislative terms just fly right by. Yeah. He's, he's working his way up to the next mayor's, next mayor's uh, race, right? Uh, no, no, no. Yeah. I, I'm happy where I am today. Of course. Hey, listen. Today. I'm going to tell you one thing. If you're on the no, city I love council, the council, the natural progression is mayor or, a, or a, you know, a county-wide <laughs> position. And to just sit there and rot away, I'm not going to cast any stones at people that have been sitting there for the past, would allow long, rotten away. I don't think you should be a lifelong city council member. I think you should aspire to do other well, things. Well, one way or the yeah. other, the city council is not going to be my life's work. I don't know what the future holds for me, uh, whether it's public or private sector, but um, I don't see myself on the council for the next 30 years of my life. I, you know, things can change, but um, being on the New Bedford City Council has been my life's honor professionally, but it's a chapter of my life. It's not going to be my life. So who knows? Yeah. You stand where you stand? Yeah, I am actually. Um, I, I, I'm doing. I, you know, this I always, is. I always wondered that. I'm like, where's he going? What's everybody, he going you know, it's funny. I'm, you know, the, the work I've been doing in Washington and so forth uh, with the White House that uh, had a number of people say to me. Uh, in fact, I think it's Chet Curtis and uh, and Miss um, uh, Wong. Is it Channel Five? Yeah. And um, she, they said, uh, "So you went to Washington?" Huh? I said, "No, I actually just got back." No, no, no. I mean, you're going to go work for the president. I said, no, unless you know something I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And he said, uh, Chet Curtis said, well, what if the president asked you? Would you go? I said, no. You tell the president, no? I said, yeah. Respectfully, I would. And not because I don't support him, but because of what I had said earlier. I believe that when a president takes office, too often they draw from the people in the communities who have their their, their uh, fingers out into the, the tentacles out into the community and know the intimate issues that are going on. And when you do that, you sever the ability to be able, when you do establish policy, you do file executive orders or whatever you're doing, you lose that benefit of having that direct pipeline to the people. Because when you get to Washington, believe me, I grew up down there, it's, it's sort of a... Um, it's a bubble. It's a big big bureaucracy that moves very quickly depending on the, the tenor and what's going on on that particular day. And so here, I mean, you need only look at Congress. Uh, I mean, look, we, our city council here in New Bedford and the, and the selectmen and the councilors in this county, they, they're, they're drilling down and doing things that are making a difference. Tell me what the heck Congress has done other than argue and scream on both sides of the aisle, wasting our time, our money, making no decisions, and tied up in all kinds of stupid investigations that are going nowhere. I mean, this has been going on since the last administration where the Congress has There's no gotten, question. They, There's they, no question. They've and, been just going back and forth, and it's just like, you know, at, at some point... Enough's enough. And not, I don't even know how to put it nicely. I mean, it's just, It know. seemed like infrastructure was going to be an initiative that both sides could have agreed on. They can't even do that. They can't even get infrastructure no. together. And that... To me, is a bipartisan issue. Come Wait, on, folks. Yeah. The opiate crisis, that's a bipartisan yes. issue. There's some things that, come on, guys. I mean, let's, let's, let's talk about roads here. Let's talk about yeah. airports and bridges and people dying in our communities. Yeah. That's something that, you know, love him or hate him, Trump's actually worked a lot on. He tried, you know, with, especially with Sessions, was a monster when it came down to, you know, attacking the, uh, the opioid crisis. Yeah. It really was. I mean, the shark can tell you. First well, the first step back, too. The first step back right now that he's working on, um, we, we, we've been working with him behind uh, the scenes and also now publicly, 
uh, to try to get the first bipartisan bill through. He, he wants to – look, it's not – there's no bill that's going to be perfect, obviously, because no. you, you have two polarized sides. And this is one of the ones where, you know, even the Cory Bookers of the world saying, look, I don't really like the, the, the way the bill looks, but I can live with it. And on the other side, you got you got conservative Republicans saying, you know, this isn't conservative enough. But you got to start somewhere and build on that. And so, and so, you know, I, I, I was on, on the phone with him uh, two days ago talking about what's going on on the border. And I said, look, there's no one that understands how to transport prisoners, how to search them, how to manage the property, whatever property they have. More than the local sheriff. More than the sheriffs. And, and deputies. So rather than expose the federal agents to the potential of liability of doing something down there that you can't, you're not normally used to doing, and have a problem happen or, get, or ex expose the uh, taxpayers to liabilities by having somebody search somebody they didn't know how to properly search them and the people file a lawsuit and on and on and on. It's what we do. We manage, we manage the holding facilities. We manage transports of prisoners. We manage the, the um, inventorying of the property that we take into custody. And um, so I said, you can get a force multiplier by having the local sheriffs. I, I, even when George Bush was in, I said, when Homeland Security happened, I said, listen, I was down there and I talked to them about when the president's second terms could roll on the round and the GAO has done an audit on the number of Homeland Security um, command centers that have been purchased nation, nationwide, and you've got 15 in a 15-mile radius, that's a problem. Yeah. When you have lawsuits happening because people at TSA, not, and I'm not criticizing TSA. You'd be the first not to. You, no, yeah, <laughs> no but, but, but when people were going through, you remember they were saying people were getting groped and all this? Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. I said to them, you, you utilize the people that have already been doing that are already doing it to train at least to train you know we've been looking 100%. at we were we were looking in the soles of sh of shoes long you know long before the shoe bomber came along 20 years ago yeah. i was doing it you know you know and you, I, and you know all like, the hiding places and, and all the things you're doing it and you're yeah. like and then you're at tsa you're like dude you're wasting your time you're just touching me in places that nothing's going to be like come on like you, you know someone that's already done it and been through it like right. I, you look at him and you're like and that's exactly 100% yeah. the truth so look for the people who Try to target your resources where they're best served, and you'll you'll do better with your overall resources uh, that are available to you. Speaking of targeting resources, Ian, uh, something I really wanted to talk to you about uh, in this region, have you on here tonight, uh, was holding uh, property owners accountable. Sure. And you know, and using our resources within the city for good use and making sure that, you know, we have good housing for people and make it an attractive place to live and not have neighbors living next door to derelict properties and, you know, all the problems that come with it. Yeah. I mean, what's going on with that? That I know you guys really did a push a little while back where, you know, you, you really tried holding property owners responsible for their properties. So uh, thank you for uh, bringing this up. So up until 2014, New Bedford never had a problem property ordinance for uh, landlords who are habitual offenders, those who are continuing to allow their properties and their units and tenements to li to uh, be denigrated and uh, people are living in squalor and they're not upkeeping their properties. So finally, I wasn't on the council yet, but in 2014, the council, uh, working with the mayor, had um, uh, ordained and ratified a problem property ordinance. And it was pretty good. It was something to get the ball rolling to start to hold some of these habitual absentee landlords accountable, whether it's sagging porches, cracked screens, uh, drug and gang activity in the units, and, and we can just keep listing them on and on. So over the last couple of years, we realized the mechanism we had, which was fine, we needed to strengthen it up a little bit and add more teeth to it. So for example, uh, up until 2018, April of this past year, uh, if you had a property uh, where there were eight, eight police calls, responses to your property that you're renting or you live at throughout an entire calendar year, you would be fined by the city of New Bedford. So we thought, well, eight's an awful, that's an awful lot. I mean, if you have a police officer going to your home seven, eight times in a year, something's not right. So we tightened that up. We said, well, if a police officer is going to your home four times in a year now, 
you are now in violation of the ordinance. So we, we tighten that up from eight to four. We have a lot of um, buildings and properties here in New Bedford that are non-owner occupied and occupied and, and owned by um, uh, uh, individuals who live out of state, live out of the region, and we don't know what's going on. We don't know how to track these people down. They have these these two, three deckers that are run down throughout all these different neighborhoods. I can tell you how you could track them down. The Sheriff's Department Civil Process Unit. Well, you know, <laughs> but you know, they pay, them, they pay them pretty well every nice month. Nice segue there. <laughs> but you know, what we did. We said now, if you're a non-owner occupied, you have to put on your door who owns it and how we can contact you by by our own local law now. So you have to put your address, your phone number, all of your contact information. So if there is a complaint or if there is a citation to be uh, mailed or administered by the city, uh, we can get that to you because it was a disaster trying so to track So all these houses down. have that? Uh, if, if, if the owner does not live on site. But why wouldn't they have a database at City Hall? So in other words... So we're getting it now. Okay, because it would seem to me it. that would make more sense. I'm not, not that that's yeah. a bad idea to start, but I'm just saying, yeah. it, you know, you know, I don't know how they have it marked on the door, but it would seem to me, if you're going to have to register anyway with City Hall if you own a home, right? You're going to have, you're going to, you're, so that information should be available compiled in a database. In a database, yeah, so you that can makes just sense. Go to, you know, by the address. Exactly. You know, I agree. Uh, and it makes that a lot make of sense. It easier, I think, probably. Yeah, and uh, it's something what that Jean Floor, I know. You should see the book this guy carries in his desk. He wants to come back to the council. That's no, what it is. No, no, he just <laughs> wants to show his book that he has under his desk. He can tell you what every penny is spent on per day. We, but, um, and, and the third part that we tie into was so you see these properties, uh, not just in New Bedford, but throughout the no, area. It's, it's, you got, you got certain property. properties that have garbage and filth and clutter that are all over the place. Well, um, we used to give you up to 14 days, business days to clean it, which was two weeks, over two weeks, that's a lot. So five days in a business week, that's 10 days, almost three full weeks to clean it. We tighten that in. You're we said, with your math. Yeah, not bad, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but we could say is now three days, you gotta clean it up in three days now, which is pretty good, three business days. So if not, now we're gonna start whacking you with these fines and we'll go up and up and up in increments and uh, if we need to take you to housing court, we will. We don't want to, but we will. So, but the point is that we've tightened these up and we've seen a lot more compliance from uh, people who have been deemed as absentee landlords in the city of New Bedford. Look, they pay a lot of taxes, a lot of these people. A lot of these uh, landlords own 10, 20, 30 uh, units, but, and I appreciate them growing our tax base. It's I can, great. Yeah, I can tell you one guy that I actually said that has a bad name in the city, and he's, you know, and I told him, I said, you know, kind of get a bad rep, and he's like, and he got mad, you know, we're at, a, we're at a Celtics game together. Okay. And he said, you know what, the city should give me an award for the amount of money in taxes I bring in, in revenue into this city. It was, I put up my own money, I put up my own, uh, my own hard work and sweat, and I'm talking, <clears throat> I mean, he spent eighty thousand dollars on on constables wow. in one year. So that's well, just to go well, show you what he's yeah. got here in, in properties. You he know, what I mean? he wasn't price shopping, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, but landlords, if you're listening, we got a guy. <laughs> so um, I'm sure you dealt with absentee landlords when you were on the council. Yeah, yeah, it existed back then. Yeah. No, yeah. it's, a, it's a good thing to, that what you get, what he's doing. You We've know. tightened it up, and I'm sure throughout the county that you represent, I'm sure you've seen and heard of it in Fall River and Attleboro oh, sure. and Taunton, other urban communities. I'm elected for New Bedford, so I'm only answerable to the New Bedford resident, but um, we were happy with the work we've done. Is the ordinance now perfect? Probably not, but guess what? We can always bring it back and rework it again if we have to. Hey, That's be the honest. beauty of it. It's, I'm, sorry. Ahead, sir. I'm sorry. No, no. Go ahead. You're, I, was you're, you're the say, host. I was just going to try to tell you that, you know, <clears throat> the sheriff, honestly, is a guy that I've seen, and I've seen people in and out of his office when I've visited from different agencies. Uh, his civil process division could probably actually help you guys out with that whole situation. Yeah, they, 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 they're really good. They're good guys. They know the neighborhoods. And they know trained. the owners. We're, we're, we're trained. Our, our people have to go through. So it might be something. I will that, tell. I will tell you. Um, uh, his pre-release uh, uh, work crews. They do phenomenal jobs for the city. Helping out with our beaches, our waterfront. Uh, they do, and, and my my colleague, my friend Naomi Carney, and the work that she does, and yeah. I give them a lot of credit. And people, you know, and I tell people when you see these pre-release workers out, these aren't hardened criminals. No. These aren't you All know rapists and murderers. Yeah. You know, they're not going to be running around with chainsaws or hammers. I mean, and you know, attacking each other. And you can speak to it better than me, but I tell people these are people who are getting empowered and reintegrated back into society. Right. And we're giving them the tools they need 
to be a functioning member of society when they leave. Right. We've had, we've had people, we had one guy who was a landscaper, he said, I'm not doing, I'm, when I get out, I'm opening my own painting business. I actually like painting more. And he helped up in Attleboro to do the, the uh, at that time, the chamber uh, building. But, um, yeah, that's, that we should be preparing. That, that, that was the whole thing. When I first started, and people started saying, oh, he's Tiller the Hun, he doesn't like inmates, and yada, yada, because he's taking the TVs out of the cells, he took the weights away and all of that, but he must hate inmates. No. The truth of the matter is that I was doing what I think should have been done a long time ago across this country, which is to set up a, a system inside the prison that allowed for prisoners to be focused on the things that were going to help them add tools to their toolbox, their life skill toolbox, so they're better prepared when they leave. So if we were in prison right now and we had a choice and they, they said, hey, listen, you guys, you can go watch TV, hang out, play cards, lift weights, play basketball, do whatever, whatever you feel like doing, or you can go to a substance abuse program and deal with your drug addiction. You can go to get your GED, attend our religious retreat, um, get into our, our, um, our culinary program. You, can, you could go to those programs or you can do those other things. We're going to play cards, lift weights, oh, and yeah. watch TV. 100%. Because we didn't come from a place, most of us, where we were ever really taught about individual responsibility. Some of these kids at, at you know, second grade, first grade, actually even before that, you know, uh, a year old is sitting on the stoop on North Front Street in a diaper and a t-shirt in November weather, and their parent may be pushing their stroller up and down the street dealing drugs. What chance does that kid have not learning the even basic disciplines of good hygiene? Yeah. So when we have people, we have parenting programs at our place. Yeah. I had a guy stop me when I was walking in my neighborhood. Car came around, it came out again, I was a little concerned, yeah. but he pulled up and it was in the morning. And he said, uh, sure. I said, yeah. He said, um, listen, I don't know if you recognize me. I was in your place. He said, this kid in the back seat here, I was told that I would never get my child back. And I pleaded with the court to give me back. And I'm taking care of my child. I'm taking her to school right now. And I just want to say thanks. Because I went to the parenting program. And if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't, mm -hmm. have, I wouldn't have my child today. And so, and we have, we have a lot of stories like that. And so, would that guy, maybe if we had those other options, ever gone to that program? None of us really know. But the truth of the matter is, we know he did and it, because he didn't have the option. It's like a business funnel, else. kind of. But you just funnel him into... Well, and, it, and it goes back to the point I made earlier. Empower, not enable. Right, yeah. right. Empower these people. Right. Everybody. Right. 100%. That's the name of the game. Now, it's at the end, at the end of the... you don't have the funding to do more stuff. Oh, we could do a lot more. And the building. Look, uh, when, I, when I first took over, prior to my taking over, <clears throat> they had the weights and all those things. But several years before I took over, they had a pool table in every unit. Oh, I know. <laughs> they didn't have it when you were there, though. It was right at the end. Right when you first got there, you took them all out. I don't think they had the, well, not they, down at Ash Street maybe, but in Dartmouth, they had them in every unit. So you're talking in about addition, the cues and everything. Oh, balls. everything. Oh, and my they'd Lord. They'd be fights with the balls oh, flying. And then, guys. Oh, my and Lord. They also, and they also had a shadow board in the units that had a hammer, a utility knife, a saw, and um, <laughs> pliers. And oh, they, would buy, they would buy like hobby wood at the canteen, and they would build like boats and things in their cell. But if you, if, if you wanted to build a boat in the cell and you had a hammer, and you had a cellmate who didn't like building boats. In fact, <laughs> that could be a problem. He didn't like he didn't like you getting pieces of wood on the floor. And he says, "Pick that stuff up." And you say, "I'm gonna pick it up. I'm working on this thing." You might be wearing that hammer. Wow. And that and 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 so of course we don't have those now. Obviously, yeah. gosh, there was locks at the end uh, when I I took all those out. They, yeah, they had locks on their they had uh, padlocks on their on their on, on their, their underneath on their the locks where you lock their pieces. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, you throw one of those in a sock and somebody dies. Wow. Yeah. That, well, they there was some of that in the yard, right? Yeah. So the guy they go out in the yard and they'd have their have it in a sock, and you know, winging around when the guy they didn't like came around, boom, yeah. wow, you could kill somebody with it. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that you change. And, uh, you know, there was some resistance to it. Um, and that's okay. And it, Change is not Well, easy. because, you know, guys would come back tired. Like, coming from the, the officer side when they were talking about it, like, you know, oh, this guy's making, you know, 
you got to go in, you got to take a guy's TV. You got to go in, you got to stop him from smoking. You got to sure. tell him, hey, we're taking the weights away. What are we supposed to do? You know, right. and then, so that's where the resistance from the officers at the time was like, wow, he's making our job hard. Mm. Yeah, but and it, it was something that, you know, the pain that that generation of CO had to go through for this now generation yes. to, to live better. Right. You know, yeah. smoking. I mean, I mean, I think we had a harder time with the staff than we did the inmates when I told them yeah, to yeah, no, yeah. no tobacco products <laughs> on the property. But, but the truth was, you know, these are the changes. Yeah, you know, it's funny um, when you when you think about it. And I think we spoke about this on a previous show. You know, the the, the being in a leadership position is not an easy place to be, and. Especially really? when you're on Facebook like this guy. Yeah, yeah, oh, <laughs> man. But leaders are real. Leaders are really defined at the crossroad when you make a decision that you know in your heart of hearts, either mm -hmm. short or long term, is going yeah. to benefit the people who you you've been asked to represent, who blindly trust you. And even in those instances where there may be um, maybe a, a larger majority than you would have expected, who say, "Hey." Um, I don't think this is this is a good thing, but you know deep down from your, what you do and your experience that it really is. It's at that moment where leaders are defined because the natural easy thing to do is sort of go along with the flow and go back to whatever you know the majority say. You know what they say: if you want to be uh, if you want to be a leader, you get, you get not a lot of people going to be like 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 right. you. But if you if want everybody to like you, just go sell ice cream. I told on my management you team, know. I said, look. You're not, <laughs> everybody likes the guy that gives away ice cream. Yeah, so. you're not here to be liked. You're, you're here. You're, you're, you, should, you should aspire to be respected. 100%. And yeah. respect can only come when you do what you believe is right in your heart. And not, not for your personal benefit, not for you know, some friend or whatever, but because it's right for the people. And when you do that, Everyone can see that, okay, yeah. I may not totally, I have people that will say to me, yeah, I don't, I'm sure you have. I don't necessarily agree with everything that you, that you do or your, all your ideas, but I respect the fact that you're willing to hold your ground when you believe in something. And that, over the years, has sort of reinforced my, my belief that, yeah, no, you're not going to, no, not any of us is going to agree on everything. But people just want to know that you're being genuine, you're doing it for the right reasons, yeah. and not, not to take care of friends or to, to, or to take care of yourself or, or get some benefit or what have you. Mm. And that's really, that's the challenge in public service, I think. No, how, about, I, how about with you? You ever come across that like, tough decision where, I mean, you guys just had one. I'm going to have to ask it because the questions came up a couple weeks ago. You know, is this stuff that you just have voted on that you know is not going to be popular that you know you just you're like oh, I, sure. I gotta do it and i gotta deal with it oh there is there are always issues every meeting there's issues whether it's a uh, a communication from the mayor on a transfer from one department to another or a mayoral appointment or uh you know we call them in new bedford motions uh but it could be also called a um uh, proclamation or whatever other cities call them where uh you know uh, one of the colleagues has an item before us and it's hotly debated, like for example, uh, the whole charter school uh, expansion debate. That's been very hot on the local level here in New Bedford, uh, whether or not to, uh, to allow uh, schools like Alma Del Mar and um, Global Charter to expand for that thousand plus seats uh, that they want to uh, put in for. Uh, ultimately, it's out of our hands. Locally, it's up to the state. The state law allows them to put in for those applications, but can we lobby? Do we not lobby? So those are very controversial issues. We're faced with them all the time. Taxes, setting the budget every year. That budget that we get in New Bedford, I don't know what it was like when the sheriff was here, but 75% of our budget in New Bedford is non-discretionary. We can't touch it, meaning pensions, health care, charter schools because the money follows the kid. So 25% of that budget we can only touch and cut. And Chris, what are we going to cut from? Are we going to cut from police, fire? teachers in schools? Are we going to cut from DPI, the people who plow our streets and fix our infrastructure? Where's the pork? It's not much. So yeah, you guys it, only it's have, tough. Yeah, a quarter of the, of, the, of the true budget is what you're, and it's tough. 
he tells me every day. I, honestly, you got to sit down in his office. He's got to show you this this law. I've he, been in his office. I used to work for him. You got to you got to see this. Uh, the this management accountability program. Oh, you've 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 updated it. Or? No, well, it's yeah. Well, we've we yeah. expanded it, but yeah, it's, two it's super detailed, like to the day cost operation. Like he gets per minute what it costs to do. To any it. any function of it. I still got it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> See, I remembered. Yeah. And the yeah. round table. Somebody gave that to me. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And uh, I got a picture of the president's playing poker. Uh, that <laughs> my brother gave me. But but no. But but that's an important, a very important thing. And in fact, I I recommended they do it statewide. Imagine. I mean, this this program you're speaking of. We, we measure 250 operating indicators every day on every shift. Every single Meals day. served, overtime, medications given out, types of medication. Um, How did you generate oh, that? It was just a, a work in progress, or did you use something? No. Or did you model after something we, else? I modeled it. In, in 98, I was in, in, at the National Sheriff's Convention, and I saw it done at Broward County. And I came back and I said, this is without question the best accountability program for government I've ever seen. It's it's pretty detailed. It's yeah, oh yeah, wow. it's very detailed. And 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 so, you know, the managers can see in real time if you're if you're running ten percent ahead of your projections today, you're going to know it. And we're going to ask you, are you aware that you're running ten percent ahead of your projections? And if you are, what are you doing about it? How are you correcting it? And it's not meant to be critical of people. It's meant to make sure that people know you got to pay attention to your budget every day. Your, yeah. your, your individual department budgets. And ironically, um, for example, if you did this statewide, well, if you did it in, in New Bedford, look at this. So I'm going to tell you statewide first. So there's five regions in the Massachusetts, right, for DPW, let's say. So at the first quarter, you bring in the, the, head, the heads of each of those, those five districts. <clears throat> and you say to the first one, Okay, Region 5, how many shovels did you have at the beginning of the year? A thousand. How many do you have right now? 500. Where are the other 500? Now, you need to know that. You need to know as the manager, did they break? Did, did three quarters of them break? Or were some of them stolen? Right. Or were some of them lost? If the majority of them broke, you're going to know as a city councilor, as a, as a a city administrator or as the governor, you're going to know that, whoa, wait a minute, we may have bid too low on this product. Yep. And we're not getting the value for the taxpayer because they're breaking and we have to keep replacing them, which is really costing us more, as opposed to maybe buying a better product. It's, it's, it's that detail. It's, it's an auditing, basically. How come you sense, guys right? But it's an auditing in real time yeah. for, for managers to look at it and be able to do it. How come you guys are so departmentalized? Like, I think that maybe you should kind of streamline a little bit, well, so to say? Have you guys explored that? Well, we've actually downsized city government by about 18% over the last handful of years, mm -hmm. so we have been cutting back, okay. but... Um, Pardon the ignorance then. Well, so no, no, it's okay. It. Yeah, no, it's just uh, something, yeah. we have been, and I can't take full credit for it. That's been John Mitchell's <laughs> kind of yeah. baby downsizing, but of course, with council oversight, with the checks and balances, of but, course. but we want to continue to obviously be pro labor and support the men and the women who work in our department. So it's trying to find, you know, that balance, right? Trying to find where we can cut where it's unnecessary and sustain and grow what we already have. I mean, I hate to, I hate to sound like the, uh, the Fortune 500 company guy, but you know, if you cut repeated positions at the top and kind of build to fill in the holes, the pothole guy, the you know, the city plow or the police officer, rather than the department heads, you know, well, sometimes you, you know, it's interesting. The patches, not potholes, but patches in the road, they've gone up quite exponentially since you were a counselor. I, I've got to tell you, you're going to be shocked when you hear this. So I was meeting with Jamie Pond, a DPI commissioner, about. A while ago, we, we meet regularly, but this conversation we're talking about patches in the road. And we have to subcontract that because we don't have the equipment to do that. It's too expensive, and you have to be specially trained to fill patches in the road. Point I'm making is it costs the New Bedford taxpayers collectively about $500,000 every fiscal year to fill about 50 patches of road work. $500,000. Half a million dollars? Wow. Half a million dollars, wow. five hundred thousand dollars for fifty patches of road. Wow. No. Just because the equipment, uh, the the labor rates, just uh, it's very specialized. So my question was, well, why don't we 
buy the equipment ourselves. No, we'll no, save no. the money, buy the equipment, and have our own people do it. Train them to do the job. Easy, easy. I just got a business opportunity. <laughs> oh boy, here we go. What, me? what do you got? What do I got? Yeah. I'm going to learn how to patch some holes for, five, for half a million dollars. I can tell you that right now. Yeah, no. But that's, but that's what I'm talking about. Um, it's an expensive business here in the city of New Bedford, and it's an over $390 million budget. Right. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. If you're paying for half a million dollars, it's simple math. You've got to find some sort of federal grants to buy equipment and train you guys to do it. And here's the other part about it, too. A lot of these holes that are being opened up, <clears throat> are being done by outside utility companies. And I know that at one point and, you guys and, were really cracking we down We are on working that. at holding them better accountable. There was an issue on Hollyhock Street about a year and a half ago. They, and I'm not kidding, the utility company, I'm not gonna name the name of the company, but the company left the condition of that street, Third World. And I exposed them on Facebook. I tagged them and everything. And I think even Mike, and I know yeah. Mike, shared it on the screenshot on Facebook. Yeah. And I got a lot of love for it. I got some, some critiques for doing that too, but that's okay. Yeah, Listen, good. if you don't do it right by our taxpayers, I'm going to expose you. I'm going to call you out. Do, do you all ever look at military surplus to see if they have the type of equipment? No, that's an interesting point. I'm going to look at that now. Because, uh, <clears throat> because sometimes yeah. you, you'd be surprised uh, what you can come across. They, and they have to turn their equipment over. That's they a do. good point. The, yeah. the, the MRAPs and all that stuff, they give it away. Right. They literally do. Yeah, interesting. Right. They literally do. I want to look into that. Thank you. Yeah. They literally yeah, that's do. That's a good lead. Thank you. Uh, I just want to, you know, add a couple questions here from the audience. Uh, one of them, somewhere along the line. Quickly, Sheriff, you had some visitors on Thanksgiving? I did. They, they were... Um, Protesters I, at the Sheriff's House Thanksgiving morning. Yeah, I did. Um, obviously, unexpected. I, I don't know if I'd known they were coming. I might have been able to prepare more turkey. Um, but I did go out and wish them happy Thanksgiving and tell them it was nice of them to stop by. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's the world we're in right now. It's, uh, it's probably, it, it didn't bother me. Uh, I felt bad for our neighbors because Thanksgiving Day. 100%. And you have people out there protesting. It's not, not very nice for them. But, um, you know. That's when you know you've made it, by the way. Oh, yeah. Politician. I'm going to get to you on the next question, yeah. Ian, about this because it, this is going to lead into my next question. It can be, it can, the, the thing, the, the only thing that's really concerning about it, it didn't concern me because they didn't bother me. Uh, they, I've been doing this 21 years and um, it's not the first time I've seen protesters. But what's, what's troubling is what's going on around the country. That, you know, if you wanted to get your message out, and it was pretty obvious in this case, if they really had a message, which was get rid of ICE and 287G, yeah. they would have, and they wanted more pe as many people to know what their, their issue was, they would have been facing up and down uh, Hathaway Road, so traffic going this way, but they weren't. Their, their whole attempt was to come and disrupt, my, try to disrupt my Thanksgiving by standing across the street, because there was no houses across the street, with their big long banners, and their bullhorn and yelling, you know, all the things they were yelling um, to me. So you weren't really there to get a message out. You were there to think you to were going to intimidate, harass. There's a difference between protest and <clears throat> harassment. And where the danger comes in is, in my instance, it didn't. I didn't care. But what was interesting was there was somebody driving down Hathaway Road, saw it, turned the corner, came up in my driveway, and was visibly angry and said, Sheriff, I'm not going to say exactly what they said, but basically they're saying, these people are a yeah. bunch of jerks. And this is, this is outrageous what they're doing. And I said, don't worry about it. They're not bothering me. They're across the street. They're being peaceful. But, but you see, that evoked some real anger in that individual. <clears throat> the more they do this... It's going to get pushed back. There's going to be a problem. Somebody's going to get hurt. Because they, they're not out there just sort of trying to get a message out. They're trying to intimidate people. We saw what happened at Tucker Carlson's house. Yeah. They we, even painted an A on his driveway. If we learned anything from the passing of George Herbert Walker was that you can keep civility in politics. Of course. Um, we can disagree on public policy, <coughs> Sheriff, course, but we can still go to the debate table or the table in general and still talk about the issues. And if we don't agree, we can still shake hands and be How gentlemen. It has to be. My, yeah, three, I, I, I come from a family of 13 children, right? Probably three quarters of my brothers and sisters are Democrats. Um, they have different views than I have as a Republican. And I'm okay with that. 
Right. I, you know, I don't hate my brothers and sisters. And sometimes we'll have some really sort of, he, he, not necessarily nasty heat in, in that way, but just passionate, or, you know, debates back and forth over some issues. And when we're done, we don't, we don't hate each other. No, you can't. You know, we, you, you, you know what's unfortunate? I see, I, I see it locally, and I talk to young men and women, and, and of all ages, who really want to get engaged and get involved in politics, whether locally in New Bedford or throughout the surrounding communities, and they'll tell me, <coughs> I'm not interested because it's a nasty, dirty business. That was going to be my next and thing. It, exactly. Uh, go ahead. What was no, the question? No, that's 100%, man. It, it's it just... a nasty, dirty business. How do you do it? I said, well, you've got to have thick skin, but you've got to love your community. And, you know... For every person that might slander or say something bad about you or slam you or whatever, there is dozens and dozens of people who will support you 100%. and will back you and will sing your praises. So you've got to remember that. But, um, you know, to your point, though, Ian, I, I, it, it, they've always said politics is, is a blood sport. But, you know, the thing that troubles me is the people, and you look at Washington, do you remember when when we had members of Congress in, in the chamber, sitting on the floor like petulant little children protesting about Ferguson or one of those issues. Like petulant little children, hands up, don't shoot, which was a, which was a false narrative. <clears throat> and I'm not picking on any party, because the Republicans and Democrats both are responsible for a lot of lack of leadership. Things. What do you think our kids, our kids that are watching TV, watching the leaders of this nation, sitting on the floor like petulant little kids. They're supposed to be the ones that are setting the example of how do you solve problems in a respectful way, as right. George W. Bush did with his, his, uh, his opponents on issues, as Ronald Reagan did with Tip O'Neill. Those were leaders. Those were people that understood that you can have a difference of opinion. You can argue vociferously. And you know what? If you win on that one, you got me on that one. I'm going to get you on yeah. the next one, maybe. Well, it's, okay. like, it's like John but McCain. But I'm not going to be angry, yeah. Right. Same thing with McCain. <clears throat> right. Right. Yeah. Do you guys think that uh, the future of politics, we're losing a lot of talent with this mob mentality, excuse me. Uh, someone like myself at one time who actually said, you know, I, I might throw my hat someday into public service. I will never put my kids and my I wife think so. that. I will never put my wife and my kids to that. I'll say it again. Never, ever. Yeah. Because of protesters outside your house because of false stories that come out 30 years later and I, and I just want to <laughs> and I just want to say and I'm sure the sheriff would agree in my opinion but should I think it's a fact wives or significant others and children are completely off limits you want to come after me or yeah, course, him man. that's fine leave the families out of it. the daughters the sons come on they didn't ask for it we asked for it Leave them alone, you know, because there are times where significant others do get dragged into it, and kids, and to me, that is a, uh, a non-negotiable, non-starter, won't even engage you if that's the way you want to go. I mean, say yeah. what you want about Trump, and, and you know, there's, there's a lot of, I think, honestly, there's some good and there's some bad. I'll be the first one to, to tear into him if I don't believe in something. But you remember when they went into the kid calling the son autistic, the youngest oh, sure. one, and... Come on, man. That's you terrible. know, it's like, imagine my kid, I'm out with my kid, and he's got like his goofy look on his face, and all of a sudden they got people calling him, you know, saying that he's sick. And uh, Come on, you know. Yeah, we're and that's, that's where, I, we, we should be better than that. And, we are better. And, than we that. are better than that. We are. You know. And we, and, but we need, there's, there are times in history where we all face a common challenge where we need to understand that our role and the positions that we have are the positions that people expect us to make the first step. When things are not going well, they expect us to show them how do you, how do you fix this problem. They're busy in their worlds, raising their families, going to work. They want to know, you know, I'm putting you here to lead. I don't expect you to be teaching my kids that the only way they can solve problems is to hate people, protest, break windows, sit on the floor and pout. I mean, that's not what we're about. We're better in America than this. And so for anyone running for office, those who are willing to do it, <clears throat> I would say this is your time. This is your time if you want to step up and move this country to a better place, you have the ability to do it. If you want to focus 
on being one of those leaders because people are dying to find leaders that are willing to do that. I tell young folks all the time when I'm in schools or whatever, I say when you turn 18, register to vote and run for something. It's the first two things I say to do. I mean, run for a select board of your town. Run for something. If you lose, big deal. I lost twice before I got in. First time I got my butt kicked, I didn't care because I, I, I cared enough to put my name out there. But you build up your rapport, you build up your, your strategies. You can't be afraid to lose in this business. Um, can it get nasty? Sure I can, but you know what? Trudge through it and just tr try your best. If you really believe in uh, civics and in your community and, uh, and, and, and being an American patriot, then no matter what side of the aisle you sit on, I, I urge all young men and women or any men and women Please, pull papers, get involved. Or even if you don't want to run for office, like I said earlier, start a neighborhood watch group. Come to our meetings. Be engaged. Start a Facebook a, show. Start a Facebook show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but don't just, <laughs> con don't just comment on his show and do nothing about it. 100%. And, and, do, and, and you know, the other thing is, you know, encourage acts of kindness. You know, uh, you know 100%, once, man. once, once, my thing once right a there. week or once a month. 100%. Hey, Find out what the person behind you is ordering at the drive through If it's a, a Dunkin' Donuts or whatever, pay it. Well, and and don't away. document it on Facebook. Hey, look at this great right. thing no, I did for this not. guy. Yeah, of course not. No. I'm, it, not a, I'm not a member of the Catholic Church anymore, but there was a priest that I really respected, God rest his soul, uh, who used to say, you know, if you need to play the bugle before the good deed, there's no need for the deed. Right. There's no need, which means don't bring attention to yourself if you're doing right. something good. Right. You know, and it's it's a hundred percent. You know, and you're not getting the real value if you are because I mean, it's how? it's obviously human nature to want to to hear people likes, say, "Hey, thank you for doing it." It's human nature to feel good. You, you want that validation, yeah. but yeah, you don't but, do it for that reason. But there's something, you don't. There's correct. something very empowering about not getting the thank you, knowing the person behind you. Uh, oh, I like that, that. You don't know who you don't know who they don't know who you are. Yeah. But like. Who is that person? And you're already gone, right? Yeah. You in fact, well, I remember going down the um, uh, New Jersey Turnpike once, and I paid for somebody's, but I did it for fun, and I would never let them catch up to me because yeah. I, I th thought, like, who is this? They, they must have been thinking, who is this? This person that's paying for my yeah. my my thing. I didn't that's do the cool. whole Turnpike, but I did it yeah. part of the way. But but no, that is it's far more empowering to just drive away right. because you you drive away and you go. That person's probably wondering, having a good day, and maybe they're now going to go, you know, I'm going to do that for somebody Spread else. Spread the kindness. I'm going to do it for somebody else. It's I don't know who that person was, but you know what? They could it's have been having a crappy day, and you just changed that all around. Right. You just changed the whole day and maybe helped their kid out because the guy was going to come home and be a jerk to his kids. You, a lot of stuff. You know, I, I, I'll tell you, uh, I, I was meeting with my management staff, and I was talking about how um, we're, we're, we're blessed to be in – the job that we're in because every day we have the opportunity particularly officers every day to make a difference in the life of people who may be housed there or people that you're working with but particularly the ones that are people when you move somebody from a worse place in life and it could be that what you just said uh, which is Chris which is the <clears throat> you know somebody might be having a bad day and you just did a simple a simple act of kindness that, that changed their whole day and we have a guy who works up at our our checkpoint? Small little shack. I'm sure you see, you job. see. <clears throat> and you know, I was talking to the manager staff, and I was using an example of how you can make a difference in people's lives every day. And I said, in fact, there's somebody that works here that every day makes a difference in your lives, and you pass by him at least twice a day. And I could see people, some people smiling, and I knew they knew who I was talking about. I said, I noticed some of you are smiling here. And um, when, I told, when I said his name, everybody was like, yeah. I said, now, you know, here's, here's somebody who's working in a very small little building who could be saying, you know, yeah, I just check the cars coming in and check them coming out. I work in a little teeny building. I've got a pretty know-nothing job, simple job. Every day when the shift come, is leaving, he stands up and he salutes every single one of the, and if he gets a chance to say good night, or hey, God bless you, have a good night, he yeah. does. But he does it for every single car that passes him, wow, nice. the people coming in, and you have a good day. And this is every day. So we, we, you know, we can move. If you can move, one person can move an organization of 500 and 
60 people that pass in and out every day? You can do it too. You, you, you imagine if it started to become contagious, mm -hmm. how this world would be. Love it. That's, we that's, could do it. Yeah. All right, we're running out of time. Josh is going to get home to his kid. Thursday's a tough one. I've been robbing him family time. Uh, Ian, I'm going to close out with the sheriff because I have one topic I really want to ask That's him. That's fine. Uh, but with you, uh, we're either going to quick, quick touch on uh, mar medical marijuana or the taxes we could generate in this city or um, anything else you want to bring. So We could talk about marijuana, see where we're at yeah. right now. A couple sure. minutes, two minutes on marijuana. Sure. So uh, as everyone knows, it's been a while since I've been on your show to talk about it, but we've written and ordained and the mayor ratified our zoning ordinance where uh, recreational uh, dispensaries or cultivation facilities could go into uh, industrial A, B, or C zones. And, uh, you know, this is a very bipartisan bill we worked on. We worked hand-in-hand -hand with the mayor, attorney David, David Garatowski, who's our um, legal counsel. Chief Joe Cordero, our health department uh, uh, director, uh, uh, Mr. Chaplin, because we wanted to make sure this was a collaborative effort to make sure that uh, all sides were accounted for and uh, heard at this table. Anyway, we ordained the ordinance. Now we're starting to, um, it's, it, we're now accepting applications. We're open at the planning office. If folks want to go down to our planning office and start pulling applications, if they want to apply, they can. I'll tell you, um, it's a process. You've got to have some skin in the game. You've got to um, really uh, have a business plan. This isn't uh, uh, the haberdashery shop down the street. This is a serious business. We can make a lot of revenue off it, but we have to see who's backing you, who are your investors. We want legitimate businessmen, businesswomen coming to New Bedford. This isn't uh, a place for Cheech and Chong to hang out and get stoned. We, we want you to produce a product, people to buy it responsibly, take it home responsibly, and if you don't, our police department's going to hold you accountable, but that's a whole other topic. The point is, is that we're, uh, we're moving forward. There are people who are pulling applications. They're uh, making sure they meet the zoning requirements. Once they get that stamped, they can fill out their paperwork, talk to the mayor's office. They can agree to a host agreement or not agree to a host agreement. And then if they do agree and it, both sides come together, it comes to the city council. We ratify the host agreement. That applicant then goes to the state at the Cannabis Control Commission with that host agreement because they won't look at you unless you have one. They then sign off on it, and then it's happy trails after that. They go and they uh, they move in. It, it, it's, it seems like big government at its best, doesn't it? Like all these layers. It may sound easy, but I can tell you one thing. Uh, guys, last week, there's probably a million dollars involved in that. Oh, it's a lot of money. It's so, a lot of money. Yeah, it's not a ham and egg operation. Right. It's not. And, you know, I had uh, one attorney uh, call me three weeks ago uh, from Colorado, and he represents a major edibles manufacturing <coughs> plant, and they're looking for a Northeast headquarters, and guess what? They call New Bedford because of how proactive we've been in the committee and establishing, and they've reached out, and they're looking at some sites. So we're talking about growth of tax base, job creation, all that good stuff. So anyway, stay tuned, folks. Not to There's a lot the to it. And the risks. Uh, we and, saw what happened in Florida, right? In regard to what? What am I with missing? The edibles. The, oh, with the schools? Yeah, with the kid, that, the 12 year old that went in and gave it to three other 12 year olds. And it was, you know what it was? It was um, gummy bears. Right. But they were obviously right. not gummy bears. They were called green flies or something. Yeah. And, right. and the 12 year, one 12 year old that brought it in knew it. And the other three, they ingested 10 times the normal adult dose of marijuana. The sheriff was. This is why. This is why Joe Cordero <coughs> had to have a seat at our table. There was no ifs, ands, or buts about it because fifty. It's here, though, Sheriff. To be it's fair, fifty-eight yeah, percent of New Bedford said no yes question. to this. No question. But forty-two percent said no. We have to respect that forty-two percent. They lost. That side lost. But you still got to respect. Respect their side. Of course. Well, that, Chris, this could be a whole other hour. You yeah. Know, no, I, I want to. Sure. I got a couple I know questions on it, so I wanted to bring it up. Plus, but also, stay tuned. You know, one of the question was. Uh, a little short-sighted, in my opinion. Will it offset tax increases in the um, future? Well, so if you're, worried, if you're ready to sell your soul over some taxes, then so be it. But that's the main. That was the question, and that's kind of going to be I'm a lot of revenue. Can it? Maybe someday. Right now, no. But if you couple that with offshore wind and maybe some other industries coming in, like other advanced manufacturing, and uh, you know, and uh, continuing to make sure that we try to pass as lean of a budget as possible, coupled all those things together, making sure our properties are assessed appropriately. Get um, some military uh, freebies? 
I've, I've been taking mental notes between that and yeah, exactly. So, all right, thank you for having me. Oh, Ian, always a pleasure. I'll have you on many more times. Hey, Sheriff, uh, last thing before we go, I know it's something you feel really passionate about. Uh, this past week, two items came up uh, nationally and locally. Uh, in Newton, the judge that's been assisting uh, illegal immigrants on getting out, one of them, I think, was a uh, on a rape charge for twenty five hundred dollars, and uh, also a call a new colleague of yours in the in the world of sheriffs just got a, a elected in uh, Los Angeles County. Uh, his name is uh, Alex Villanueva, and he basically said he is going to kick ICE out. Yeah, this is um, obviously troubling. Uh, first, first. It the issue in Newton with the judge. That is, uh, I remember testifying before uh, Congress about a year and a half ago, and Congressman King said to me, Sheriff, what should be done with these elected officials um, who are harboring or concealing people they know to be in the country illegally? I said, issue arrest warrants for every one of them, because it's a felony under federal law to do it. This judge essentially attempted to harbor and conceal someone who not only had been deported twice, what's even more troubling is that this guy was operating under three aliases. Three, that's, that's identity fraud. It's a felony in each of those instances. And so this guy, who knows what he was doing under the three different aliases, but the point is he wasn't even being honest about who he was. So, so he'd been deported twice. He was picked up on drug, uh, drug possession. He had a fugitive warrant out of Pennsylvania. If you, if you as a judge don't see that as a threat to public safety and you have no problem trying to protect this person so they can get away, you don't belong there. You, 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 you essentially have violated your oath and you violated the trust of the American people. I mean, the people in that community, that guy went downstairs, he was let out the back door, he scaled the fence and took off scaled the fence of a courthouse yeah. and took off. And this judge it, it turned off, intentionally turned off the recording so that it, what she was talking to the, his attorney about couldn't be heard. So, so look, I'm not going to prejudge the facts aren't all out yet, but it sure doesn't look very good. And uh, I, I think, frankly, the fact that the judge knew the ICE officer was there waiting you, you essentially undermined the law enforcement community and said, I'm more concerned about this guy who's got three aliases, he's got a fugitive warrant, and has been picked up on, on possession of drugs, being able to be protected than I am the people of the community where I sit as a judge and the law enforcement community that has to deal with these people. It's very sad. And then as far now, as how, now, how do you now how do you uh, go ahead and prosecute this guy? Is it is is it prosecutable at some point for what he did through the feds? It's or, a woman. I mean, excuse me, uh, her. Yeah. Well, uh, the U.S. Are we going to get there? The U.S. Attorney is definitely US, looking into it. He's, he, the U.S. Attorney is investigating it right now. He's also investigating some of the court officers for being involved, which is a shame. Which is a shame because they were probably following orders. Right. But the point is, yeah, they're going to do what the judge probably instructs them to do. Um, so who knows where that, that plays out, but, but certainly, rightfully so, the U.S. Attorney's looking at it. Under 1324 Title VIII, it clearly states, anyone who attempts to harbor or conceal someone they know to be in the country illegally commits a felony. So, and I even remember mentioning to, to Attorney General Sessions about a year ago, I said, listen, right when I was down there testifying on this, I said, listen, until we prosecute people who have taken an oath of public trust who have violated the trust and said, we're going to create a special class of people who don't have to follow the law and we're going to help them avoid uh, the law. Um, until you prosecute them, that's going to continue to go on. Once you start prosecuting these people, you're going to start to see sanctuary cities aren't so popular anymore. People aren't so willing to go out there and say, hey, I'll bring them into City Hall and let them hide here, uh, as the mayor of Boston said. So, um, look, we, we, we have an obligation to the people. If we're in, fortunate enough to be serving in public office, or whether it's a judgeship or whatever, 
people are trusting us to do the right thing. 100%. Yeah. And so, and as far as the sheriff goes out there, and, and I, I don't care whether it's California or wherever, I've said from day one, I don't know how anyone in law enforcement could reconcile in their mind that they are willing to ignore any law that's on the books. If you don't like the laws, lobby to get them changed. Get Congress or your legislature to change them. But in the meantime... You got law enforcement. Exactly. <laughs> you hit the nail on the head and you took an oath to uphold those laws and to protect the people, not, not, the, not, not the criminals, not the violators, the ones who abide by the law. That's your obligation. Seems like uh, every time I have you on, we, there's a new uh, one of these that pop up. There'll be more. I think it was like two times already, and it's separate incidents that just continues to happen. And people and, continue to die. And yes. Innocent people. There is no big boogeyman, but it, it does happen. You know, and, you know, oh, it doesn't happen often. All right, so if it, one of those was your mother or your sister or your son, and we're then, not even, then, then it matters. And we're not even counting the number of, of kids that are getting drawn into the opioid crisis because the drugs are flooding in over the borders. Oh, yeah. The fentanyl and everything else. So 100%. That's where it's coming from. Yeah. I mean, it's documented. China's sending it over to, to uh, Mexico, and Mexico's running it up here. 100%. Why, why isn't China sending it to Canada? Why aren't they sending it somewhere else? Because they know exactly yeah. where the easiest route is to get it in. Yeah. Right? The, the funnel, the... the Who's kidding uh, who? Yeah, the fun, it's already been established. Right. You know, the pathway, right. the, the pathway for the drugs to get here. You know, and it, in part, it's, it's America's incessant need for drugs that there's an issue that we can also attack that as well. Oh, there's you no know, question. There's, you know, the fight on drugs. Maybe it shouldn't have been fought with guns. should have been fought with rehabilitation and stuff like that back in the day when we were dumping billions into it. We can yeah, go on and on about that. Which we still that. need to do But now, the fact of the matter is you just can't do one or the other. It has to be both. That's right. So part of that is to cut the supply off as best as we can. That's exactly right. And, you know, stronger border protection is part of that plan when it comes just to the fentanyl. If people don't want to see it that way, they're just being blind and ignorant, point blank. Yeah. It's coming from there. It's known. It's documented. Go watch a Vice episode. They sent it from China. It was, used to come through the U.S. Postal Service. Now the Postal Service is pretty hip on it. They finally caught on. It's really just coming up through the Dominican Republic, via Puerto Rico, or Mexico. And lots of people are going to die from it. Fentanyl is, I mean, one of our, I think we talked about this before, one of my officers at the Astro Jail had to be Narcan three times. Yeah, it's going to be weaponized, in contact too. With it. Yeah. Yeah, you and I had a meeting not too long ago with uh, an expert in the field, and it's a real threat. Yeah, they are going to. A terrorist will use fentanyl in a, as a to create mass casualty. Can I, can I just uh, mention something that's not really to do with that, but just wanted to say, I thought it was really cool that you came up and got in that bite suit. Oh you yeah, know, not many people would were, would be willing to do that, but it was really cool that you did that. A lot know? of guys on the job that I know that I you know I'm still friends with, uh, guys that I respect, um, Superintendent Souza, yeah, being one of them. Uh, I'll do anything to promote a good. Toy drive. Yeah. You know, no, we appreciated like, that. We, and if y'all had tasers, I probably would have let them shoot me with a taser, too. It's <laughs> well, just, you're a lot braver than I am. But, yeah, so it is what it is. But, but it was cool you did it. It, it really was. It was fun. Uh, and Josh enjoys when I do crazy stuff. Uh, he, he really enjoyed when I ate jail food. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. now he enjoyed, uh, and I told him, hey, I said, I'm going to go get bit, bit by the dog you in. He's like, yeah, yeah. yeah, and he just smiles. He just loves We're just happy you didn't bite our canine back because that would have been a real problem. No, I don't. Yeah, I, poor I, canine. I'm a little, I'm a little, <laughs> I'm not that well trained, but I'm a little, just a slight <laughs> bit. Uh, but speaking of that Twitch, right, do you have any specifics? It seems like you probably yeah, actually, want to talk about it. Yeah, actually, um, we're on, on the 11th. We're, um, we're from 11 to 2. We're going to have uh, people that want to to drop off toys. Uh, to our Dartmouth facility, our canine that put this together in support of the um, Justice Resource Institute out of Berkeley. They, um, they support these uh, kids who are foster kids and kids who are adopted. Um, a number of them who have don't even really believe in Santa Claus and never have because Santa Claus has never come never existed. for any of them. And um, so, you know, we want to we um, do everything we can to, to give those kids a Christmas and um, and let them start to have the wonder of believing in 
in Santa. That, uh, That's the good spirit of it, man. Yeah, it's what it's all about. You 100%. know, we, we have those opportunities, not just at Christmas, but other times. But this time of year is really important because we don't want to see any kid not, not be able to experience the spirit of Christmas. Uh, this is the first year where my kids six and three are really enjoying it. So it's, it's pretty special yeah. Christmas for me this year. Speaking That's of which, cool. we're about 20 minutes over. So Josh and I got to see our kids. Yeah, I understand why. Sure. You know, you know, I could keep talking. I could keep I've talking to you too. We have, we, have, we, we have the same, we have the same disability. <laughs> we came from the same, <laughs> we have the same DNA. I got you. Uh, but thanks, thanks for having me. Oh, anytime. Great to be any, here. anytime. I appreciate but you. Thanks for what you're doing for I, the community. I, and I really enjoy, I really yeah. enjoy this. Uh, you know, I'll just say it right out before we close this. The best part of this show is the opportunities that I've been blessed with to be able to help people. Yeah, well, you do Stuff it. that I've never, I've always wanted to do, but I never was able to put it together because I didn't have the right opportunities. And now the opportunities just keep folding. I just keep saying, no, my wife keeps saying, you're spreading yourself thin, you're spreading yeah, yourself yeah, yeah. thin. So, well, you're not just moving the community, you're moving the country, and thank you for that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Special thanks to Ian Abreu, city councilor, always uh, willing to participate in public uh, debate and, and, and conversation and let you guys know exactly what's going on in his mind. And, and as usual, thank you, Sheriff Hodson, for doing the same. Uh, I can tell you one thing, the sheriff never, or Ian, never really script their uh, visits here. Straight up the, off the cuff, we don't plan the shows. And uh, it's just very, very open and out front conversation. And we appreciate uh, your viewership on this episode. See you uh, maybe next week. I think we're going to do an off-topic show. We might go visit a 110-year-old resident of New Bedford. Wow. 110. Oh, and that neat. So we're going to try to get her some, some birthday cards from, oh, cool. all, from all the viewers. And uh, I'm off for the weekend. I'll see you guys later. Good night. God bless.